The one is called the consistent or called consistency. Uh, now the, the definition will be a little bit scary. See? The definition will be if the probability of parentheses, you know, the difference larger than the <laughs> converts to zero is n goes to infinity for any small value of eta, then we can claim that the theta had a consistent estimator. Let me say, gosh, that's not human language, right? So, so you know, the textbook called it that way, but let's try to translate that formula into our language. Let's see what's the, what's the real meaning of a consistency. First of all, little, let's do it little by little. Introduce a jargon, n goes to infinity. N is our sample size. Sample size, for example, 100 numbers, 1,000 numbers, 10,000, and so on and so forth, right? So n goes to infinity means we, our sample size is really, really large. So that's, that's the meaning. Basically, n goes to infinity just means we have a really, really large sample size. Uh, you know, uh, we don't have a clear cutting off value of how large is large. But anyway, you know, n goes to infinity just means our sample size is really, really large. So in most textbooks, uh, they call it a term, a jargon, asymptotic. For example, we have a asymptotic property. What's the meaning of asymptotic? Really, really simple. It just means when n goes to infinity. So, <laughs> You know, we econometricians like to use uh, this uh, fancy terminology, try to <laughs> try to scare the, <laughs> the, the, those who are not familiar with uh, this. So <laughs> very often, you know, you can go to a conference, so you can present something, say, asymptotically speaking, <laughs> you know, and without explain, <laughs> explaining the idea, you know, <laughs> if, you're, if, you, if you don't know what's the meaning of asymptotic, Probably you're not uh, you're, you're not there to ask, right? You assume everybody knows. <laughs> Actually, really, really simple. What's the meaning of a sympathy? This means sample size really, really large, right? Now you can you can use this kind of terminology to scare your friends. <laughs> a sympathetic. <laughs> That's the idea. So first of all, consistency is the only one, is the only standards related to asymptotic, right? Recall unbiasedness or efficiency. Actually, just now, we, we never talk about n goes to infinity, right? Recall, see right here. Then we introduce the formula of unbiasedness. Then we introduce the, the idea of efficiency. We never say sample size n goes to infinity. In other words, no matter sample size, uh, say 10 or five, no matter how small it is, if we can always measure the standards, unbiased or not, efficient or not, right? But now only standard number three, consistency. Now we are talking about the case, a symptotic property, right? So let's continue. Theta hat minus theta, absolute value. What does this mean? The difference, right? Basically the difference between theta hat and the true theta. The difference in term absolute value, right? And uh, the probability larger than something, the probability the difference is larger than something goes to zero. Larger than something goes to zero. It means basically for most, basically no chance, there's no chance the difference is large. Right? That's basically this formula trying to say. Probability goes to zero. Again, means there's no sense, no, no chance, right? No chance for, for what? No chance that the difference is large, larger than something, right? Or equivalently, we can say, you know, we can almost assure that uh, the difference is small, right? The difference between theta hat and the, the true theta, the difference will be small, right? <laughs> and so that we can, by using our language, we can say the sample size is really large, getting bigger and bigger. So that the difference between theta hat and the true theta, their difference basically 
getting smaller and smaller so that the difference is so small so that you can you, you can say they really close to each other, right? So that's basically the idea of a consistency. So some technical points right here. First of all, you know, the difference between the two, theta hat and true theta, there could be a difference between the two, but hopefully when your sample size ain't getting bigger and bigger, their difference getting smaller and smaller, they close to each other. <laughs> Still remember the example I showed you last time, for example, the sample average, right? Then our sample size n increases from 10, 100, 1000, right? Basically, our sample average, the performance become better and better, getting closer and closer to the, to the true value, right? So that's basically the idea when sample size increases to infinity. The theta hat and the true theta, their difference shrinks to zero, getting close to each other, right? That's basically the idea of uh, consistency. So right here, uh, some, uh, you may wonder, uh, how, can we, how do we prove consistency? Or you can say uh, the previous two standards, consistent, uh, no, the unbiased and also efficient, do they imply consistency? For example, if an estimator say theta hat is unbiased, can we say it is always consistent? <laughs> the short answer is no. You know, <laughs> unbiasedness doesn't always imply consistency. How about the opposite? If we got uh, a consistent estimator, does it imply our theta hat is always uh, unbiased? Short answer is also no. <laughs> you know, doesn't go so the other way around neither. So short answer is, uh, you know, they, they do not imply each other. Uh, unbiasedness doesn't imply uh, consistency. Consistency doesn't imply unbiasedness. So that uh, they, short answer is that uh, they do not imply each other. They doesn't go that way. So. Uh, later on, I'm going to give you an example to show you, actually, I can give you some counter example. Estimator, for example, is biased, but uh, it's consistent. <laughs> or could it be opposite, consistent, but also, you know, <laughs> but got a, got a bias. Uh, the intuition is this way. For example, suppose the estimator has a bias, has a bias. But as long as the bias, for example, is a function of sample size n. For example, suppose a bias something like one over n. And when sample size n getting bigger and bigger, the bias getting smaller and smaller. So that when sample size really, really large, bias getting smaller and smaller so that eventually shrinks to zero. So <laughs> in that case, in that case, although for finite sample, for example, if your sample size is only 10, only 20, we got a bias, right? <laughs> but as long as we our sample size getting bigger and bigger, the bias shrinks to you know getting smaller and smaller. So that large sample size kind of solve the problem of bias, right? So that we are trouble free. That's basically the idea of uh, consistency. And actually, that's the reason why in practice uh, uh, we hope for large sample size. And so when we run later on, we, we're going to talk about regression. Then we run the regression, we always uh, hope for a large sample size uh, because a large sample, very often, we can solve the problem of uh, those, uh, for example, bias. If the bias, you know, even though there's a bias, but no worry, as long as a bias getting smaller and smaller, right? Large sample size is gonna basically <laughs> solve the problem of the bias. So that bias is so small so that we can ignore it, right? <laughs> And that's basically the idea. Uh, in the textbook, we have a theorem, which is uh, if you want to directly prove consistency, it's pretty hard. But uh, luckily, we have a theorem, which means uh, we have a sufficient condition. It means uh, if we can prove bias shrinks to zero, and the variance also shrinks to zero then sample size n goes to infinity. Then we can conclude theta hat is consistent. Theta hat is consistent. This, this uh, theorem is easier to 
to, to prove. In other words, uh, for example, in practice, if you want to show theta hat is uh, consistent, if you want to start from the original formula definition right here, uh, it's, it's too hard. But you know, usually it's easy to derive bias. It's easy to derive variance. So as we mentioned just now, as long as they are a function of uh, n, for example, something divided by n, right? So as long as uh, if there's uh, some bias, if then, you know, no worry. If the variance are not the smallest, no worry. As long as they both of them shrinks to zero, then sample size in goes to infinity. Then you know we achieve a consistency, right? So that's the idea. When sample size increases, both of them perform better and better, so that we achieve consistency. Uh, that's the idea. Um, uh, I also provide the proof to show x bar is consistent. So we do not require proof, but uh, the, the proof basically try to show, uh, try to derive bias. First of all, the, the simple average x bar, actually, even in finite sample, if, even for small n, the bias is a zero, right? So let alone really, really large uh, sample size n, right? So bias is a zero for sure. And a variance, also shrinks to zero. Why? Because of variance, recall the formula, sigma square over n, right? So variance shrinks to zero, right? Because we have n at the bottom, then n increases. Something divided by n decreases, right? So that's a short proof. So we can show x bar, simple average is consistent, right? So x bar, simple average is, is unbiased. It's efficient. It's consistent. That's why uh, very often people use a simple average. People jump to average all the time, right? So uh, then how about other options? For example, just now we discussed a little bit such as uh, the, the stupid estimator, the first number, right? We showed it's not good in terms of uh, efficient efficiency. For example, first of all, actually, the first number, x1, actually, in terms of first standard, it actually, it is also good. Still remember? Let me go back to the... In terms of first standard, unbiasedness, even the stupid estimator, x1, is also good. Why? Because x1, x1, you know, expectation of x1 is also mu, right? No matter x1, x2, x3, for each xi, expectation is mu, right? That's why even for x1, the very first number, the expectation is also mu. So from the first standard, the stupid estimator is also, you know, satisfied, right? It is also unbiased, right? But from the second standard, efficient or not, then we know the x bar is better than x1, the second formula, right? Because x bar is more efficient. It has a smaller variance, right? How about the third standard uh, consistent? The first number, the first number, you know, x1. The bias, it is a zero, right? Uh, as a variance of x1, shrinks to zero? Short answer is no, because uh, for, for x1, such a stupid estimator, variance will be always sigma square, never shrinks, right? Never shrink. So that's why, you know, that stupid estimator not consistent, right? So, so that's a quick proof. For the details, you can, you can read my lecture notes for the for the detailed proof. But so far, we do not require, we just requ require the intuition, as long as you know, understand what they're, you know, what they try to tell, and the, what's the intuition, unbiasedness, efficiency, consistency, good enough. Okay. Uh, how about median? So far, we didn't do any proof for median, right? Actually, strictly speaking, if you want to do proof for median, it's it, it's hard. It's harder than than the sample average, 
but I can give you the intuition. I can provide the uh, quick, quick answer for you. First of all, the median will be also consistent. Actually, we verified that one from the little simulation uh, we tried by increasing number from 10, 100, 1000, right? <laughs> the, you know, the performance, you know, improves, getting better and better, getting closer and closer to the, to the true value zero, right? So the median short answer is that it is, it is uh, consistent. <laughs> so that, but again, the proof, it's a little bit harder. So that, that's why we do not require the, the proof for, for the median. So unbiased uh, uh, and efficiency, uh, later on, we may, might come back to, to introduce the, the, you know, the detail. But short answer is, uh, I can give you the short answer about, for example, efficiency. Compare mean and median, mean and median. Uh, I will say mean, the variance will be smaller. Mean, the variance will be smaller. Uh, so that in, you know, suppose the true distribution is really normal, then the mean, the simple average will be a better choice than median. Then you may wonder if mean is always better than median then why we still talk about median, right? If something, if mean is always better, why we bother to, to introduce the idea of median, right? <laughs> if something is always better, then we don't care about others anymore. We don't have to talk about others anymore, right? If that's really true, then who cares about any other issues, right? <laughs> Such as median. <laughs> so it must be the case uh, that uh, Median, and sometimes median might be better than mean. Can you guys think about a situation that the median performs better than mean? Um, if you have highly skewed data, then the median can be better than the mean because means are, are impacted by outliers. Uh, yeah, right, right, check. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> please go. <laughs> Right. Precise answer is uh, very simple. Outliers. <laughs> Not about skewness, actually. <laughs> you know, outliers. For example, let's say, suppose, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, let, me, let me see if I can. Um, which one is... Uh... Let me, let me add it. Um, uh, suppose I, I just want to type some. I just want to type some numbers real quick. Suppose, uh, you are a racer, you run marathon every year, for example, you run those races. First year, you are the first place. Uh, next year, first place. Next year, second place, second place, third place, uh, third place. Also first. Uh, how many of them do you have, Marie? Uh, okay. Uh, okay, then this year, Unfortunately, for example, I twist my ankle, I end up with uh, 1,000th place. <laughs> I, I hurt my leg, right? You know, unfortunately, I barely finished the game, right? So that I end up 1,000th place. So now, you know, I have two options to, to, to calculate, to measure how good I am. The first option is an average, right? One plus one plus two plus two plus three plus three plus one thousand <laughs> divided by seven, right? <laughs> uh, why I create seven? I, I should create ten numbers to, to make the calculation easier. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> the average must be something like uh, is that one hundred something. <laughs> anyway, a kind of large number, right? Their average, right? <laughs> How about median? Median will be basically the number is made of right here. Right? So the median is simply two. So how good I am if you use median? 
I'm second place, <laughs> right? So <laughs> I would say median is a good number, is a good measure in case of this guy, outlier, right? <laughs> Actually, this outlier, no matter how large it is, no matter how many zeros I put right there, right? The median is still two, right? No matter how large that outlier is, right? That's why outliers, you know, kind of affects your mean, but not median. So median, the nice part, advantage of median is it is robust to outliers, right? So that short answer is, uh, when do we use average? When do we use a uh, me median? Short answer is, uh, suppose we don't have outliers at all, our distribution is nice. It doesn't have to be exactly symmetric, but uh, you know, as long as uh, no outliers, then mean, simple average will be a better choice. It will be more efficient, right? But if you really have outliers like this case, right? Now, median will give us a, the, the, a better result, right? But mean will be biased, right? <laughs> so median is good in terms of robust. robust. Whenever you say robust, you have to say robust to what? A median robust to outliers, right? <laughs> so that's the trade-off between mean and a median. Later on, later on, and you know, if you have time, we we might introduce a, a median regression. Median regression will be basically ro again robust to outlier. If you have outliers, if you want to run the regression, the median regression will be the answer. <laughs> that's basically the idea. Um, Let's see. Mm. So two theorems, the law of large number, central limit theorem. You probably uh, saw this terminology before, but uh, I, I bet your teacher may not explain <laughs> all these details, but they may not explain this by using our human language, right? So what's the law of large numbers? Again, this is not, uh, uh, I, I won't put this in the exam or homework, but for learner purpose. The law of large number, which is uh, suppose xi, uh, you know, follow whatever distribution, two mean is a mu, two variance is sigma square. Then, you know, i is um, one, two, three, four, and two n. Now, as long as uh, as long as n is really large, then the average, simple average x bar, gonna converge to the true mean in probability. That's the idea, the law of large number. So that by using our human language, it's if your n is large, if your sample size is large, then the simple average will be always a you know <laughs> good measure. Will be always close to the true value of mean. That's the the idea about the law of large number. By the way, by the way, this law of large number, you can all also apply to the second moment, third moment, first moment, so on and so forth. For example, right here, this is a sample average of xi, right? Right hand side mu, what's mu? Mu is expectation of xi, right? So sample average of xi converts to expectation of xi. So in other words, if you want to get an estimator for expectation of XI, simply replace the expectation by average, simple average. Similarly, if you want to calculate, if you want to estimate simple, you know, expectation of XI squared, if you want to estimate that expectation of XI squared, then a simple estimator will be simply, again, replace expectation by average, average of xi squared. That's simply a formula. That's simply, a, you know, so by using the law of large number, the average of xi, xi squared gonna convert to the expectation of xi squared. Similarly, simple average of x cubic converts to expectation of xi cubic, so on and so forth. I tell you, you know, those details later on. Uh, that's basically the idea of uh, the law of large numbers. The next one, central limit theorem. So 
Again, XI follows such a true mean or true sigma square. Now, when sample size n goes to infinity, now the difference between x bar and mu, the difference multiplied by root n, gonna follow a normal distribution. So, you know, first of all, central limit theorem implies the law of large number. In other words, law of large number is a weak conclusion. Central limit theorem is a strong conclusion. Take a closer look right here. The difference multiplied by a really large number root n goes to something, right? In other words, if you divide root n to the right-hand side, divide root n to the right-hand side, the difference between the two basically is something like one over n times something, right? So that their difference is really, really small. One over n times something, right? So that, that's why, so that, that's why second conclusion basically implies the first conclusion. First conclusion, the law of large number basically says the difference shrinks to zero, right? So the second conclusion already tells you how close they are. If you divide one over n to the right-hand side, the difference between the two basically is a fraction of one over n. That's why the mm -hmm. n getting bigger and bigger, their difference getting smaller and smaller, right? That's the first conclusion. Second conclusion, the difference multiplied by root n actually follows a normal distribution. Normal distribution is a really nice conclusion. Again, right here, I want to emphasize originally x, we don't need original x follow normal. In other words, original x could follow whatever distribution, could follow chi-square distribution, could follow t distribution, could follow Poisson, you know, gamma, whatever distribution. But their average gonna follow normal distribution. That's a really nice conclusion because later on from this central limit theorem, we can do test, for example, t test, f test, and so on and so forth. We can check the distribution of a normal distribution simply because the law of large number all, all come from here. <laughs> That's the idea, you know, central limit theorem, law of large number. Uh, let's take a break. After break, let's uh, learn some uh, computer 